we're going to go back to the nervous system. Again, we left off with the acetylcholine receptors that I checked. And it's kind of complicated. And I, I definitely drove home the, the whole idea of that all preganglionic autonomic neurons release acetylcholine. Therefore, all postganglionic neurons have cholinergic receptors. So in the ganglion, they're nicotinic. And in the, to the effector, they're muscarinic as far as acetylcholine receptors go. Okay. So I think I know a lot about acetylcholine. I'll pick up some, tonight I'll go through some questions and make sure you know a lot because I don't want to spend too much time on each neurotransmitter because it could take a really long time. But I think you get the idea of acetylcholine. I think that's really important. And those are ligand gated channels specifically for acetylcholine. Now we're going to talk about regulation of these channels based on the ligand. And at the beginning, we talked about different molecules, right? We talked about organic molecules that some are polar, some are nonpolar, like lipids are nonpolar. And proteins or amines or peptides are polar. So polar is basically hydrophilic, non-lipid soluble, where nonpolar is hydrophobic and lipid soluble. So I don't want to write the hormones here or anything like that, but because we're talking about neurotransmitters, but something like testosterone is a lipid. It has an easier time getting through that biphospholipid membrane of your cells. But in this case, we're talking about neurotransmitters and these are not lipid soluble. They're not gonna enter the cell and make the change that they need to make, whether it's an IPSP or an EPSP, excitatory postsynaptic potential or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, All right? So the ligand is the neurotransmitter that will bind to its receptor but inside, on the inside of the membrane, you have G proteins. And this is why they call this G protein coupled receptors with channels. Of course, the channels are part of the receptor, as you saw. Okay, so the ligand is the neurotransmitter, which, and the receptor is on the channel. So again, this has to do with pretty much all polar molecules, polar neurotransmitters, like epinephrine is polar, or hormones like growth hormone are polar, but testosterone is a lipid. So it's nonpolar, gets into the cell and then makes the, makes the change, whether it's anabolic. Of course, testosterone is a steroid that's anabolic, will make increased protein synthesis. So that would enhance the production of proteins from amino acids. So first of all, you have the receptor, the receptor protein, and these are all proteins, anything embedded in the membrane, channels, receptors are all proteins, right? But it's also an ion channel. Now the ion could be an inhibitor or a excitator or excitatory channel. It depends on what the channel is for, right? So if you remember, think of it this way. If the ligand binds to its receptor and opens up sodium channels, therefore allowing sodium to come in, is that an excitatory neurotransmitter or an inhibitory neurotransmitter? Excitatory? Yeah, it is. That is, I'm so happy you said that. So what if it was a, a potassium channel where potassium comes out? Then it's gonna be inhibitory. So it depends on the ion channel, right? And where in the body it is. So I always say like GABA is a, is a very inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, right? In the brain, but it's not always inhibitory everywhere. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain, but it's inhibitory in some other parts of the body. In fact, in other parts of the brain, it's it's inhibitory, like in special senses. So the channels 
and what the channels are for are really important to change that membrane potential. Yeah, so nicotinic, nicotinic of course, is always excitatory. That's never, never inhibitory to nicotinic. All right. Professor, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. You know how glutamine is a supplement? Glutamine? Glutamine. Glutamine, okay. Yeah, right, glutamine. If you, they sell it as a supplement, like a vitamin shop or whatever. If you, if you don't, if you aren't in a, in like a, if you aren't deficient in glutamine and you take glutamine, does it enhance anything or is it just like, you're just, it's just expensive pee at that point because it doesn't really do much. Yeah, I, I think that that might just increase the load of your nitrogen balance for your kidneys, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think it would be too much amine, especially, it depends on how much extra you're taking. But if you're, you, you can be deficient in that. You can be deficient right. in that. So, you know, like you said, if, if you aren't deficient in it, you might be wasting your time. Unless your body demands it. If you're pregnant, that's a different story. Right? So it depends on the body's need at that time. Or if there's other medications that are using that particular amine, the glutamine. Okay. So again, the binding of acetylcholine, now this is not specifically nicotinic, so it's jumping around a little bit, <clears throat> but in a, in a neuron, you're opening both sodium, potassium, uh, sodium and potassium channels, but the gates are closed for, for, sodium, uh, for potassium during depolarization, and then the gates for sodium closed during repolarization. So depolarization is sodium flowing in, and repolarization is potassium flowing out. I think we got that down, right? So obviously when you electrochemical gradient um, to change the electrochemical gradient, more sodium flows in and less potassium out. But to maintain the resting membrane potential, that's more about potassium coming out as well, right? Leak channels, basically just bringing it out, but the sodium potassium ATPase pumps are a big deal. So we kind of know all this. I believe we know all this with the, the binding of the neurotransmitter, but then this is the ligand. This is the receptor, which is part of a channel. Beautiful picture here, by the way. You see all those lipid tails. They don't show the cholesterol though in there. Big membrane embedded proteins. And remember, these are proteins. These are all transcribed from your DNA to messenger RNA. These gotta be perfect and they gotta be in abundance. All right, so the channel's open. I don't think this is anything new to you. You should really understand this at this point. <clears throat> and that's a great learning outcome. So ligand gated channels continued. You see the sodium depolarized of the cell. Now, this necessar now this, here's the point. This doesn't necessarily have to be a threshold depolarization. So it could be below threshold, right? Remember Chris's underwear? Was Chris's underwear? Well, he doesn't feel it all day, right? So, but these are excitatory post synaptic potentials. So of course this is incoming to the somas, the cell bodies and the dendrites, which makes a lot of sense. It could be the axon too, but remember that, that little portion, that trigger zone that's between the initial segment of the, of the axon and the axon hillock is where all these EPSPs and IPSPs are summated. So again, several molecules, of course, because this is flooding the synapse. So all of that is graded and then summated. So if it reaches the threshold, which what's the threshold in the neuron? Anybody remember? How many millivolts? Come on, make me feel good here. Yeah, right around there, right about 155, good for you. Yeah, and of course there's some leeway for that. So once that reaches this, all these EPSBs and depolarization reaches the minus 55, off it goes into a action potential, which is all or nothing and has to repolarize with a period of refraction. Very good. So most of that is summated around the axon hillock in the trigger zone. Outstanding. So here he says, this is minus 50. I like minus 55 better. So here's the resting membrane potential and you're getting stimulus by binding that neurotransmitter, which in this case, we could say acetylcholine, it's excitatory. So once it reaches threshold, off it goes to action potential. What a great picture this is, by the way. 
because it's showing the spot where it's all summated. And now this will continue to each node of Ranvier. Depolarization, repolarization, depolarization, repolarization, all the way to the axon terminal. This is a great picture. I really like that. Okay, so this is just kind of summing everything up. So, you know, before an exam, just go through these because it really makes you understand terminology, right? Where everything's going. Here's a maximum depolarization. We say 30 plus 40. It's all basically the same thing. I'm not going to trick you with 30 versus 40 or 50 versus minus 50 versus minus 55 or, or minus 90 minus 85 for hyperpolarization. So let's see anything, anything cool here. Effective drugs. Let's take a look at this on an action potential. So acetylcholine are inhibited by this tetra, tetrodotoxin. I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to ask you that. But excitatory postsynaptic potential, ACH inhibited by QRA, not by, I'm not going to ask you that. I don't think that's important for us right here. If we do a case study, we'll get more specific with the medications. But last lecture, I mentioned, um, I believe, atropine and curare. So kind of know what they do with your acetylcholine. So now back to this, and this is, this is a little complicated. We're going to go through this step by step. So when you, you see a G protein coupled channel, it, the neurotransmitter or a hormone, whatever the chemical messenger is or neuromodulator, is always a polar mo molecule, like a protein, not a lipid. And that's really why we see this, right? So of course, the receptor is bound by the ligand, right? Like, and we don't have to talk about dopamine yet. We're gonna go into what dopamine is later. But most of these channels that we're gonna talk about are the norepinephrine channels, the adrenergic receptors, because norepinephrine is a amine. It's a, pe a peptide, right? It's not a, a lipid. So again, this is talking about ACH. Whenever you see muscarinic, that's ACH. Right. And that is also a G protein coupled receptor as well. So here's the, the breakdown. Now the G protein is inside, it's not really telling you this, but and I'll show you a picture in a, in a few slides. G proteins are inside the membrane on the bottom of the membrane. And there's three, there's the alpha, beta, and gamma, right? So once the acetylcholine binds to its receptor, which is a G protein coupled receptor, right? Then one of the G proteins will diffuse and the channel will open for a period of time. But again, this is not where the sodium is coming in. This is a G protein activated channel. So one of the G proteins, and it could be alpha, dissociates from that complex. So stick with G proteins in there. So again, this, these are the steps. It's much better to show you with a picture, but let's take a look. <clears throat> so when the membrane protein is not bound, the G protein is three parts, alpha, beta, and gamma, three parts inside the membrane attached to the receptor inside the membrane and the intracellular fluid. And again, you don't have to worry about what's binding in between the G proteins. So once the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, the alpha subunit, and usually the alpha subunit, especially with acetylcholine, releases this GDP and GTP. Now you don't have to know that, but the alpha subunit dissociates and goes somewhere else, right? It goes somewhere else. So Usually there's another protein, like an, either an iron, ion channel or a enzyme, right? So it depends if this is inhibitory or, or excitatory, of course, right? So this is it's a little confusing because so, this could be either an, an, an ion channel or an enzyme, what the G protein is going to activate. And it's usually an enzyme. And I, again, I'm going to show you a picture which will help you with this. So the effective protein, of course, is either excited 
or I mean, it's either activated or inactivated. So basically this GDP or GTP, this is guanine triphosphate and guanine diphosphate, kind of like ATP, except a different nitrogenous base. And sometimes it's C uh, AMP, which it comes off of ATP. And basically what these things are, especially something like CAMP or GDP or GTP are called second messengers. Okay, so of course, then the, the molecule of neurotransmitter or whatever it is, it is not bound to the receptor anymore, and then the process stops. So again, I got to show you a picture. Here's the picture, thank goodness. And there could be a couple of different steps to this. So here is your receptor. Now, this is a G-coupled receptor, which again is mostly a muscarinic for acetylcholine, but this is very common in norepinephrine receptors. And that's what I'm trying to, to tell you. And then this would be for something that's polar. So this is just a receptor and it's a G protein coupled receptor. G protein coupled receptor. So here are your G proteins, right? Which it, when it's not bound, that's what it looks like. But when the neurotransmitter binds to its receptor, you're gonna activate these G proteins and they dissociate. So again, it's showing the beta and gamma attaching to a channel, right? This is attaching to a channel. So pay attention here because I'm gonna ask you a really important question in a little while. Now, a couple of things could happen here. Now, sometimes there's an enzyme in the membrane and that G, like the alpha G protein will activate the enzyme and then create the change that opens up the channel. So in this case, it's a direct connection with the two other proteins to the channel. So this specific channel right here is what's happening. Look what's happening. Potassium is leaving the cell. Are you seeing this? Because I had a good, really good question coming up. So this particular, and this is muscarinic, which you know is cholinergic, which you know is for acetylcholine. So this is binding, activating the G proteins. You don't have to know about the GTP and the, and the GDP in this case, because they're really, you don't need a second messenger in this particular reaction. But the other two G proteins will bind to this protein receptor, which happens to be a potassium channel, which is allowing potassium to come out. So take a look at this. I'll give you five seconds just to look around here and I'll get in your face. Because this is the takeaway I want from all that writing we just went through, that whole long table. Okay, are you ready? Where am I? Here I am. So this is a actual potassium channel is what this particular um, coupled reaction is creating. It's opening potassium channels. So potassium is leaving the cell, right? So you, do you think this is a, uh, an inhibitory or excitatory change? Inhibitory? It's inhibitory, everybody agree? And it's muscarinic, it's acetylcholine. Now, where is this happening? Like where, where the, what, do you remember the, and this is, I'll, I'll tell you right now, this is an autonomic pathway. So it's not somatic, it's not skeletal muscle. So what is the effector in this case? Do you remember from looking at the slide? It's inhibitory, right? It's inhibitory. Let me show you the slide again. The potassium? No, the effector. What's the effector? Acetylcholine? No, the effector. Remember there's effectors? The, the heart? The heart. I knew I knew it could count on you, Dr. Yaya. The heart. And not only the heart, but the SA node of the heart. So what is the parasympathetic? And this is parasympathetic because it's acetylcholine at the, at the effector, not norepinephrine. So what does the parasympathetic do to the heart rate? Does it increase it or decrease it? 
decreases. It decreases. Remember me eating my burrito, right, in the park with the coyote or the bear? So that's rest and digest. So it's going to decrease action potentials of the sinoatrial node by opening up potassium channels. That's what acetylcholine does at that effector in the autonomic nervous system. Very good. Everybody understand that? So that's kind of kind of the takeaway to, to all of this. So take another look. Again, you didn't do the cardio, but I, when I talk about the conduction system, the cardiovascular system, it's going to make a lot more sense when you get that information. All right. So this muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, this is an IPSB. This is an inhibitory postsynaptic potential in this case. So acetylcholine is inhibitory here. But your book didn't really tell you that. I mean, this is an autonomic nervous system reaction. It's parasympathetic. And I'll even go further. Well, I mean, we know it's muscarinic and we know it's cholinergic, which muscarinic can only be cholinergic. But the nerve that does this is cranial nerve. Anybody know what number? I don't think I've ever said this. There's 12 cranial nerves, right? The one that does this mostly and it's paired is cranial nerve 10. And that's the vagus nerve, the vagrant, because it goes all the way down to the pelvic area. So a vagal response is an inhibition, slowing the heart rate down. Sometimes there's too much of that. Sometimes you have excessive vagal input and your blood pressure drops too low, your heart rate drops too low. That's, that's a pretty bad situation because again, this is parasympathetic, which decreases your action potentials at the pacemaker, which is the sinoatrial node in the heart in the right atrium right here. That's electrical tissue because the, the heart is autorhythmic. It has its own conduction system. It's very specialized muscle tissue. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So basically the nervous system just controls the heart. It doesn't make it beat. It just controls the heart rate and the contractility. Outstanding. So G-coupled protein channels, and remember, they're, they're receptors. They're, they're not just channels. They're receptors at first. So in this case, you told me you saw it. potassium channels created an IPSP, inhibitory. So in the heart, it's not just in the heart. It's, it's only in the SA node, in the AV node. There are no muscarinic receptors anywhere else in the heart besides the sinoatrial node and the atrioventricular node. You can't just say the heart. That's, that's, not really, that's not really true. The heart is much more sympathetically um, innervated. So there's more adrenergic receptors on the heart than there is cholinergic. Crazy, right? So you were right. Hyperpolarization. Potassium came out. Who knows what the memory, now in the heart muscle, it's a little different than, than a neuron. You know, your resting memory potential could be like minus 85 in the heart muscle, which we'll see next week and the week after when we talk about the heart. So let's also talk about smooth muscles in the stomach. Smooth now, remember, this is autonomic. The book is, again is not telling you this. This is autonomic. So I'm eating my burrito, all good, right? My heart rate is low. No, there's no um, coyote, there's no bear. So I'm in parasympathetic, para, right? Acetylcholine all the way, all the way. Nic nicotinic and muscarinic. So what about the smooth muscles of my GI system? Not just the stomach, my whole GI system, starting with my esophagus, which brings the burrito down to my stomach, all right? Now those, G proteins are not opening potassium channels, right? It's closing potassium channels, more likely opening sodium channels for depolarization because I want to digest the burrito. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in parasympathetic stimulation right now. So that would be more of an excitatory postsynaptic potential in the autonomic nervous system. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? That was really good. That was really good. So this is why I put 
and put so much emphasis on what is the effectors for the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So the, I'll repeat it again, it bears repeating. The somatic nervous system is always acetylcholine and the effector is always skeletal muscle and it's voluntary. The autonomic nervous system, which you know by now is sympathetic and parasympathetic branched motor. The effectors for the autonomic nervous system are the heart, which is cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, which is your, all your GI uh, walls and all your reproductive walls and respiratory walls and glands. So cardiac muscle, smooth muscle and glands are your effectors for the autonomic nervous system. Really important. We talked about this, I think, acetylcholinesterase is the um, enzyme that degrades acetylcholine. Okay, so it in inactivates acetylcholine by, by hydrolyzing it basically into acetate and choline. Right? And it's rebuilt because again, this is a this is the most abundant neurotransmitter. Like I said, so these two byproducts are taken back up into the postsynaptic. Well, sorry, the presynaptic or axon terminal, and they're they're re synthesized into acetylcholine and stored in the vesicles, right? Very good. It doesn't really look like Pac-Man, but okay, you know, it breaks it up and these parts are taken back up through the membrane and form vesicular acetylcholine. So acetylcholinesterase, again, is here. They kind of look like Pac-Man. Like splitting, hydrolyzing, enzymatically hydrolyzing acetylcholine. And it's showing you more that it's on the postsynaptic uh, membrane, which could be true in some synapses. Sometimes it's floating free in the synaptic cleft. Okay, this is important. I like talking about this. So acetylcholinesterase is um, cholinesterase. It's the same thing. Right? It's the same basic thing. So why would we want to inhibit acetylcholinesterase? Right? Why would we want to inhibit it? Right? Because we, if we want to inhibit like a, a medication, again, you're not going to have to remember these neostigmines and um, physostigmine and pyroxostigmine. But you have to know that these are cholinesterase inhibitors. They stop the production of the enzyme, acetylcholinesterase. So that's going to allow more binding of acetylcholine by flooding the synapse with acetylcholine. So this will increase the concentration, the cholinesterase inhibitors, the medications will increase the concentration of acetylcholine in the synapses. So this is really important. Um, myasthenia gravis, did I mention what this is? I will again, if I didn't. But myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune condition where your T cells, your immune cells will destroy your acetylcholine receptors. So if your receptors are less in number because of this condition, right? It, they don't destroy every single receptor, but they, they, they destroy a good percent of them. And it depends on what part of the body you're talking about. So myasthenia gravis is a true muscular condition. It's autoimmune, but it affects the muscle condition. It affects the um, skeletal muscle. Myasthenia gravis. These are skeletal muscle acetylcholine receptors. So it's more somatic nervous systems affected here. And technically the peripheral nervous system, right? So how do you treat myasthenia gravis? So of course, one thing is to give them one of these medications, but every medication has a side effect, right? Because you're not, you're not just gonna affect the legs, because myasthenia gravis basically affects like your eyelids. You get um, what's called ptosis, is a droopy eyelid, ptosis of the eyelid. Sometimes it's a very subtle sign. You know, you, you, you're dealing with a patient like your PA, you're doing a, a triage on somebody and they look otherwise normal, except just, did you ever notice that your, your left eyelid is kind of drooping a little bit? Now that's a general uh, sign. It's not a symptom. You're, you're, you could measure this and document this. 
but it's also a, an early sign of multiple, multiple sclerosis as well. But myasthenia gravis is one of the first things, and they may have some visual impairment as well, or moving their eyes, but it usually affects women, you know, older than 40, and it usually affects the leg muscles first. So the treatment could be flooding the acetylcholine into the synapses, somatic synapses, by inhibiting acetylcholinesterase by using these medications. Another treatment sometimes is removing the thymus gland. If you remove the thymus gland, now the thymus gland is really only active when you're in your first eight years of life or seven years of life. So your thymus is basically a boarding school for your T cells. That's where T cells come from, right? Thymus gland, your lymphocytes, your T lymphocytes, which basically attack viruses and cancers type cells. So sometimes in an adult, you have an overactive thymus, which increases your immunity. So it increases the likelihood or exacerbation of an autoimmune condition like myasthenia gravis. And technically, um, must, uh, multiple sclerosis is a autoimmune condition, but multiple sclerosis is a condition of the nervous system, right? Sclerosing of the, the myelin, it's loss of myelin actually, and hardening of the myelin sheath, which slows down conduction, ends saltatory conduction. So the myasthenia gravis is, like we said, like we may have mentioned uh, muscular dystrophy, of course, which is a truly muscle condition which I could show you as well. Okay, and the other one is Alzheimer's disease. Now this Alzheimer's disease, now there's many neurotransmitters um, that are involved in memory, but acetylcholine and epinephrine actually, but acetylcholine is important for some of that memory connection to the parietal lobe or the temporal lobe of the brain and also the hippocampus of the brain. So it's been found that the same drugs can improve some short-term memory when given to mid-stage Alzheimer's, not late-stage Alzheimer's, mid-stage Alzheimer's. So definitely for somebody who has mild cognitive impairment, MCI, at the beginning, low, early stages of dementia, not in this, we don't know if it's Alzheimer's yet until it progresses, but you know, early signs of dementia, if you give these medications, it could maybe improve some of your short-term memory. So the, the drugs we're talking about here are cholinesterase inhibitors. Yeah, okay. So again, we could have a problem the other way, inhibiting the acetylcholine esterase and overstimulating the cholinergic uh, synapses by using nerve gas and organophosphate pesticides, but we're not really gonna talk about that. Although you gotta be careful of paraquat, right? I hear on the news now, paraquat. Did you hear that? Paraquat, anybody know what that is? Paraquat, it's like a um, insecticide that they use in, for growing um, certain chemicals, but they use it, it was, it was pretty important in, in the marijuana fields. So I guess they're trying to be conscious about the med medical marijuana um, that's grown if it contains paraquat. But I, I'm not sure if that's exactly what they're talking about, but it has come up as uh, becoming a problem again in the, in the farm system. Paraquat was an insecticide, which could, let's see, as you saw, can ultimately cause death if those receptors and acetylcholinesterase is affected, right? Crazy, right? Okay, acetylcholine in the peripheral nervous system now, specifically, and we're pretty much talking about that for the most part. We're not in the brain and spinal cord really all the time with this, unless I mentioned the brain. So somatic motor neurons, of course, somatic, the effector is going to be skeletal muscle. So you get to the neuromuscular junction. Now you have a synapse between a, a neuron and a muscle. Right, neuron and muscle. And, and I'll, I'll give you a little hint. It's always acetylcholine in the PNS to the effector. Now in the spinal cord, it's, it, it's inhibit. you have inhibitory and, and, and excitatory. I think we mentioned reciprocal innervation right last time. So we'll, we will get into that a little bit. Okay. 
so the muscle part, the muscle membrane, which is called sarcolemma, has receptors for acetylcholine. That's why they call it the motor end plate, because the muscles also have an excitable membrane that have to go through depolarization and action potential, just like the neuron. They really do. They have to go through all of that to contract. And that's what muscles do. They just contract, they shorten. Right. So in, in skeletal muscle to the effector, I could say that, you know, most of the time acetylcholine is going to be excitatory, but it has to be inhibitory as well. So you know that EPSP is always going to be open sodium gated channels, voltage gated channels, of course, right, along the muscle, just like it is a neuron, right? It starts with a chemical synapse or uh, ligand binding and then becomes um, voltage gated along the length of the motor end plate, which is really the muscle membrane. So, and again, we're not going to talk about every step in muscle contraction because that would take me an hour and a half to talk to about specific muscle contraction. And we'll do that with cardio. Okay, but it also happens in somatic and I'll, I'll talk about that when I do it. Um, again, certain drugs block. So these, these would be blockers like a beta blocker, right? Like, again, this is not adrenergic, but blocking like curare we mentioned is antagonistic of, of acetylcholine. And of course that leads to paralysis or death. I mean, I talked about that before we left last time. So again, you can use it as a muscle relaxant, but it has a lot of side effects. Curare. Curar, whatever you say. These are pretty cool. These are pretty cool. Some of the ones, again, I'm not going to have you ask uh, you know, all of these, but again, botulinum toxin, which is basically a bacteria, right? Inhibits the release of acetylcholine. So, you know, if you start to get a little, you know, laugh wrinkles around your eyes, you take it, you know, 3000 bucks. I'll do it for you. Put a little Botox in there and you know, your lines go away for a period of time. But you know, it also treats headaches. It also treats gastrointestinal problems like constipation. Sometimes it's severe constipation in children. So Botox has a lot of medical uses besides the cosmetic, right? Curare we talked about. And, and that's about it. Neostigmine is an interesting one. Inhibits acetylcholinesterase. That's the cholerase inhibitor in the post um, synaptic membrane. Nigerian B. How about that? And strychnine prevents IPSPs. The spinal cord inhibits contraction of antagonistic muscles. That is a tough one. So let me just tell you what an agonist is. Like, um, you know, if, if, if you're standing up and you step on a nail, right? We talked about this. You're, you're with your right toe. Your, your leg is going to automatically flex, your knee is going to bend as you withdraw from that pain. So that is contracting your hamstring muscles, your, your posterior thigh muscles. So that agonist in that case, in the Shakespearean tragedy is the hamstring muscles, the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, semimembranosus will contract to bend the knee to withdraw from the pain is a reflex. So easy to talk about these on reflexes. At the same time, your quadriceps will relax. So there'll be IPSPs to you, uh, in a reciprocal innervation to the, to the quadriceps to relax so they, they can elongate and not prevent the movement, right? So strychnine kind of throws that whole business off. And I'm not sure exactly how that happens, but it does pre pre prevent the IPSPs. So I'm sure that, you know, somebody used this as torture somewhere in history, which I really don't want to talk about, right? Okay, so Alzheimer's disease. Now this is a CNS problem. This is a problem with the brain, All right? Again, it can be associated with loss of the neurons, which is really what the condition is. But it, we don't know the cause of Alzheimer's disease directly, but basically what happens is the proteins that are being designed mostly for structure and ion channels, um, have a faulty cleavage, meaning they, they kind of become insoluble because of the way they're designed, the machinery that makes them. So it could be genetic, right? I mean, 
the enzyme that cleaves certain proteins and their membrane proteins sometimes kind of get in the way of the synapse. So you can't get the ions through. You can't get a synapse between two neurons in the brain because of these plaques. And the plaques are basically big bundles of amyloid protein, beta amyloid protein. So that's between the cells. And then inside the cells, you have what's called neurofibrillary tangles. And that's, again, proteins kind of bunching up because of faulty design. And basically, the neurons will die and the brain tissue will shrink. So you're losing the neurons that produce acetylcholine. And most of this happens in the parietal, bone, uh, parietal lobe. and temporal lobe. I'll go through those later, but exactly where they are. And hippocampus, which is actually part of the limbic system. Hippocampus means seahorse, but it really doesn't look that much like a seahorse, that particular part of the brain. So you these neurons are dying, you're not getting the synapses, so you have loss of short-term memory mostly, but in late stage Alzheimer's, you basically lose it all. So your brain is basically shrinking. And you really don't know this until you do post-mortem autopsy. Right? So you can't see this in early stages anyway. Late stages, you could see loss of brain tissue on a, on a PET scan or MRI, but really it doesn't show up as a sign till much later. Here's myasthenia gravis, which I kind of explained before, which is an autoimmune disease that is attacking those nicotinic receptors. Now this is not autonomic, this is mostly skeletal muscle, you see, because it says skeletal muscle. So this is what you have to know, your book doesn't really tell you this, but this is somatic. It's not autonomic, thank God. I mean, it's terrible either way. But I'm just saying, if it was autonomic, then it would affect your heart, right, and your your organ systems. So basically, you know, it's muscle weakness because you don't have enough receptors to receive all the acetylcholine. This is why you give them that you know, anticholinesterase uh, drug. So it does affect your eyes and eyelids mostly, and, and droopy face to change in your facial expression, but not like Parkinson. Parkinson's is a much more severe uh, mask-like um, presentation of a patient as opposed to myasthenia gravis is more that eyelid thing, that, that ptosis, droopy eyelid on one side. And it's usually on one side. And, and that's something you could see. Yeah. So more, that was a lot about acetylcholine, wasn't it? We really learned a lot about acetylcholine. So monoamines, now again, these are based on amino acids. And that's what the amine means. They're very small molecules. And these are also everywhere. You know, it's like, now you're reading about mRNA, right? It's everywhere, you know, it's, it's you know, COVID vaccinations and all this. So these monoamines are everywhere in your body, all right? So catecholamines, just know the term, are all derived from the same amino acid and that's tyrosine. So we're most of it, when we talk about catecholamines, we're mostly talking about norepinephrine and epinephrine. And they basically have the same receptors. We talked about this. They're really basically the same thing with slight differences. Now, dopamine um, doesn't really have much to do with norepinephrine and epinephrine um, directly. But dopamine is also derived from tyrosine. And that's why it's also called a catecholamine. When you say catecholamines, you know, in neurology, most of the time we're talking about norepi and, and epinephrine. All right. All right. Serotonin, again, is a neurotransmitter, and that's derived from this tryptophan or L-tryptophan, that specific version of that amino acid. I right. know tryptophan is something that's an essential amino acid. This is one of the amino acids we have to take in from our diet to build those proteins. Not in excess, though, Chris, right? Not in excess, you know, you know, they always say tryptophan makes you sleepy, right? It's serotonin, and, and it's also the neurotransmitter. I'm sorry, it's also the amino acid that's the base for melatonin, right? So it's kind of crazy to think that, you know, 
overloading on tryptophan is going to make you sleep better, but it, it can work. It'll work for me because I'm a real placebo guy, right? Histamine is more like a neuromodulator uh, and a hormone to me, basically. Histamine causes massive vasodilation and increased permeability of blood vessels. So that's derived from this histidine. histidine. This is used chemically too for a lot of things. So basically the amines are the neurotransmitters and these are just some memorization stuff, nuts and bolts of the names, what catecholamines are. Remember these are, are gonna be catecholamines, these two, but they, their receptors are adrenergic. All the receptors we talked about before for acetylcholine are cholinergic. Cholinergic is only for acetylcholine and the two types of cholinergic receptors are nicotinic and muscarinic. So that only has to do with acetylcholine. So now we can move on to adrenergic, I hope. Watch the next page tells me about acetylcholine again, I'll go crazy. Yeah, like ACH, thank God they're not talking about it, right? So monoamines, they're synthesized in the Exon terminals, right, of the presynaptic neuron, just, and they leave through exocytosis, just like acetylcholine. Again, we learned acetylcholine. And they diffuse across the synapse and they bind to specific re receptors. And guess what? Most of them are G-coupled, G-protein coupled receptors. Crazy, right? So the monoamines are, are usually taken out of the synaptic cleft by reuptake. You know, taking back into the um, presynaptic terminal, kind of like the choline and acetate that is brought on by the presence of acetylcholinesterase. So then we have this MAO, which you've probably heard of, MAO oxidate dase, which breaks down um, your monoamines. So, you know, for, for people that have excess. Um, or, or too little epinephrine, say, you know, you, again, they might use this for Alzheimer's as well, um, or for blood pressure. You know, if you have too much epinephrine is my, my point, too much epinephrine in your, in your synapses, that would be way too much sympathetic stimulation, right? Way too much sympathetic stimulation. So again, you'd wanna use MOA to decrease the sympathetic stimulation. Now, if you have the opposite, you use a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, right? And that will stop the degradation of something like epinephrine, which is an amine, or, or possibly dopamine, or possibly dopamine, but use definitely di use different drugs for things like Parkinson's. Because you're gonna hear that Parkinson's is more involved in dopamine shortage, do shortage of dopamine, which is a, a monoamine, but it's a tryptophan based monoamine, neurotransmitter. So this, you know this story, look, guess what? Action potential, you heard of that? Synaptic terminal, calcium channels opening, binding with your vesicles, right? And then the neurotransmitters released into the synaptic cleft and binds to its receptor. And then this could be a G-coupled protein receptor. It could be just a ligand gated receptor attached to a voltage, uh, to a channel, like a ligand ion channel, ligand gated ion channel, right? So in case of norepinephrine, again, it depends on where it is, but a place like the liver, which is gonna be storing glycogen in case we need free glucose, the norepinephrine receptors on your liver hepatocytes are all G-coupled, uh, G-protein coupled receptors, just so you know that. So now the norepinephrine that's released, I'm glad they're talking about norepinephrine, could either be degraded by the MAO, monoamine oxidase, or, you know, after, of course, it's been taken up back into the um, presynaptic terminal. All good? Look at this, it's also talking about how the neurotransmitter is designed or how it's put together, right? Tyrosine, the amino acid, into dopa, then 
dopamine and then transmitted or transformed to norepinephrine. So this little phase of dopamine before it molecularly changes to norepinephrine because they're all based on tyrosine. Unbelievable. So now this is what I was alluding to before and it says up on top uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. So they're chemicals you take to block the breakdown of monoamine neurotransmitters like norepinephrine, epinephrine and dopamine. So again, treatment of depression. This was probably the initial chemical treatment of depression before they found out that there's a lot of side effects to this and it's more like serotonin is more of a problem than is the epinephrine, right? Because epinephrine is sympathetic. This is the, the chemical that's released during when you're exercising. It's not an endorphin, but it's, it's, it'll keep you alert. It'll, it'll make you feel a little bit better temporarily as, until it's degraded, right? So, so inhibiting the MAO, the enzyme that breaks down something like epinephrine or dopamine, and dopamine, of course, is a reward neurotransmitter. All right, so it was good for panic disorder and anxiety. Of course, we don't use it for anxiety unless it works, you know, and, and sometimes you don't know why these things work for certain people. And of course, it, it can be used for Parkinson's disease because it increases the concentration of dopamine because Parkinson's disease is a lack of dopamine. And again, when you do the CNS, you'll see how dopamine controls, starts and regulates your motor functions like contraction of muscle, All right? So there's, of course, potentially dangerous thing, uh, outcomes with any of these chemicals, All right? Especially if you mix them with, with excess tryptophan, like you might go to a, like a so-called, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's some great um, holistic uh, doctors and great holistic clinicians who prescribe things that aren't, technically aren't medications like St. John's wort and other foods that contain excess tyramine. So again, you're mixing things is the point here. I'm not gonna go into each chemical reaction here, but it can be dangerous, especially if you're taking excess amounts of these all natural things, so to speak, because anything you take above a recommend, recommended allowance basically becomes pharmaceutical in a way, like, if, like vitamin E or other vitamin E or vitamin A, which are both antioxidants, if you prescribe them in high doses, above, well above recommended doses, basically you're prescribing a medication, is my point. And you're gonna have adverse reactions, right? especially if you mix it dietarily with the, the tyramine, right? So it can increase your sympathetic output because of epinephrine, which will increase your blood pressure, potentially dangerous you know, in conjunction with a, an MAO inhibitor, because MAOs break down the epinephrine, the dopamine and norepinephrine. It's, a, it's an enzyme, right? It's a monoamine oxidase. MAO. Okay, just a little more action. They're not ion channels because they need a G protein. Coupled reaction. Right, so the receptor is a G protein coupled receptor. And here's where you need the class. And then this is the classic septic messenger, like I mentioned before, cyclic AMP, which is hy hydrolyzed. Uh, I'm sorry, ATP is hydrolyzed to cyclic AMP because you have to activate the enzyme that does that. So let's see what's coming up here. So here we go. Let's say this is epinephrine, right? Which is a catecholamine. It's a monoamine, of course. It's a specifically a catecholamine because it's from tyrosine. So the norepinephrine binds to its G protein receptor, like you saw before, and then the G proteins dissociate. And then an enzyme is activated, and that's adenyl or adenylate cyclase. And that hydrolyzes ATP, the cyclic AMP. So cyclic AMP is the second messenger in this reaction, this protein reaction. So cyclic AMP will activate another protein, and this is usually a phosphorylase or other proteins to open that channel. So the five phosphorylase is basically the enzyme that basically binds to the ion channel and it opens it to cause 
uh, depolarization or in, in the heart muscle now, in the heart, it could be different. It could be a calcium channel, right? It could be a calcium channel in, in blood vessels and other parts of the heart. It could be a sodium channel, which causes your depolarization, or it could be a potassium channel causing hyperpolarization. Depends on where the effector is. But again, because something like epinephrine, which is a catecholamine, monoamine, it's a protein, it's not lipid soluble. It needs this G uh, protein coupled receptor in order to do its work. So once the catecholamine like norepinephrine or epinephrine binds to its receptor, the G protein complex, and there's three, just like you saw before, will dissociate. One of those usually alpha will activate a membrane enzyme, which is a protein called denylate cyclase. And that hydrolyzes ATP to cyclic AMP. And your cyclic AMP is the second messenger that will activate a phosphorylase and the phosphorylase will act to open the ion channel and make that change in that cell, whether it's hyperpolarization or depolarization to action potential, it depends on what the effector is. It's crazy stuff, right? So let me give you an example here. Let's see, where are we talking about now? Uh, let, let's talk about a calcium channel. Like this is gonna be a calcium channel, ultimately. And this is gonna be, let's say heart muscle, cardiac muscle. you need to have a point of view and these pictures are fantastic. Okay, so, and I'm not even talking about the SA note here anymore. I'm not talking about heart rate. I'm talking about contractility of the heart, right? And we're talking about norepinephrine, which clearly is a um, monoamine. It's a catecholamine, right? And it's got another name called noradrenaline. So it's adrenaline. So I think it's clear to everyone that this is gonna be in the heart muscle now, this is the effector. This is the membrane of the heart muscle. This is autonomic and it's gonna be sympathetic. Everybody should agree to that, All right? Cause it's gonna, two things that norepinephrine is gonna do from the sympathetic nervous system. It's gonna increase heart rate to the heart, of course, and it's gonna increase contractility, which make it contract more and stronger, All right? Blood vessels are different, slightly different. So you know this is going to be a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. Because it's adrenergic because it's for epinephrine, which is really norepinephrine, which is really noradrenaline, which is the same thing. Same thing. So the, this is what makes them all the same because they all have the same receptors, basically. Okay, this is really complicated. So let's talk about this. So now I'm in sympathetic stimulation. I'm getting chased by the bear. Let's let's have a bear today. So my preganglionic sympathetic neurons are going to release acetylcholine first, right? Acetylcholine first to my nicotinic receptors in my ganglions, my sympathetic ganglions. But then the postsynaptic neuron is going to release norepinephrine to my heart, which is my effector, not the SA node now, this is the muscle. Okay, so now the norepinephrine will bind to its very specific beta-1 adrenergic receptor. How do I know beta-1? Because I remember it this way. There's beta adrenergic receptors in the heart and in the lungs. There's only one heart, there's two lungs. So the heart is beta-1, the lungs are beta-2. That's how I remember it. So these are always beta one adrenergic receptors. So once that norepinephrine binds to its receptor, this G protein complex will dissociate and the alpha and G protein will bind and activate a membrane enzyme called adenyl or adenylate cyclase. The adenylate cyclase is gonna hydrolyze the available ATP, you know all about that, to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is gonna activate a protein kinase, a PKA, protein kinase A, and that is gonna activate it. And this 
protein kinase will open the ion channel in this case. So cyclic AMP is the second messenger in this G-coupled protein uh, receptor reaction. Second messenger is cyclic AMP. So the cyclic AMP phosphorylates this protein kind of kinase there by activating it. And that is what opens up the ion channel. Now in this specific effector, which I drew out was cardiac muscle, it's gonna allow calcium to come into the cell. Okay, calcium will come into the heart muscle cell. So take a look at this for a second. <clears throat> we'll go through this, we'll get in your face, see how we can figure this out. So here's some important things here. Um, so now I'm in sympathetic stimulation. We, we know this is gonna happen with the SA node and it's gonna increase my heart rate, all right? But I'm talking about the heart muscle itself. So what did epinephrine do for my calcium channels? Did it open it or close it? For my, for my muscle membrane or my heart? It opened them, right? Mm -hmm. It opened them. So this is a, a, an important thing here that calcium in any muscle, whether it be um, skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle, or smooth muscle is gonna enhance muscle contraction. And the heart needs calcium because you're gonna learn again, when we talk about muscle contraction that calcium basically starts the whole reaction of the muscle protein sliding together, binding together and sliding. There's two proteins called actin and myosin. They kind of cross over each other and shorten on many levels. So really the only function of a muscle is to contract by shortening and doing work. So in the heart, it's about contracting to pump blood out of the left ventricle to get all oxygenated blood to every cell in my body systemically, right? So you need homeostatic levels of calcium thereby. And in this case, epinephrine is increasing your intracellular calcium, which increases your muscle contraction. So epinephrine is gonna increase my heart contraction. Of course, epinephrine is also released in exercise. Right? Because exercise is basically sympathetic stimulation. So that whole cascade is a, basically about, in this case, is about opening calcium channels after the binding of, of the norepinephrine. Everybody okay with that? Any questions? That's a tough one. That's some serious physiology there. But that's what we know. And that's how it happens. So again, let's look at the players here. You have, before norepinephrine even gets there, you have this, your beta-1 adrenergic receptor, which is a G-protein coupled receptor because it has these proteins attached. And remember, these proteins have to be transcribed perfectly in the, on the ribos, um, in the DNA, in the nucleus, and then translated via your transfer RNA and the amino acids that you have in your, uh, available in your cytoplasm. So they all have to be very specific. And of course, you know, there's certain genetic conditions that, or not conditions, or states. Trans, remember we talked about uh, transcription factors and these transcriptions being increased by being turned on or off or, or slowed down. So again, these are all proteins. And then once the, the neurotransmitter binds, in this case, norepinephrine, it activates and dissociates those G proteins, and then will activate another protein, which is an enzyme. All, almost all, as you know from the last test, that you know that most enzymes are proteins. In this case, it's a adenylate cyclase that will hydrolyze ATP to cyclic AMP. So you have to have another enzyme, which is a protein kinase that has to be transcribed. And cyclic AMP, your second messenger in all these monoamine G-coupled uh, protein receptor reactions. This is always the second messenger cyclic AMP. So that activates the protein kinase, which opens the receptor to allow calcium to come in. And then calcium is gonna bind to a muscle protein called troponin, which is gonna allow for 
the binding of actin to myosin and make a really strong contraction. Now, this, of course, is autonomic because I'm talking about heart muscle and I'm talking about sympathetic and I'm talking about norepinephrine. There is no norepinephrine release in the somatic nervous system. It's all acetylcholine and, and glycine. Acetylcholine in the somatic nervous system is almost always excitatory at the neuromuscular junction. It can be inhibitory, of course, with reciprocal innervation. Are we okay? Any questions? Anyone have any questions? We're all good. Anyone? Anyone? All right, good, tough topic. Glad you're on board. Let me get this out of the way, sorry, I don't, let's start up here. Serotonin, okay, serotonin. And we're gonna do CNS later after the break, so you'll see um, the parts of the brainstem, what the rough nuclei is. Like the brainstem is basically your midbrain, your pons, and your medulla oblongata going inferiorly. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter. Remember, this one is based on tryptophan, L-tryptophan. So this affects mood. So now we're talking about biopsychology here, biology, right? I'm, I don't know anything about psychology, but I know biology affects psychology from what I hear, right? So behavior, um, daily behavior. And affects sleeping and uh, intake of food or appetite. And also serotonin is not just like when you hear it, and, and most of these neurotransmitters, when you hear about um, serotonin, you, th you know, maybe the first thing you think about is depression or lack of uh, serotonin, but it also has, it's also a vasodilator in certain areas for, most of, for the most part, it, it opens up blood vessels and increases blood flow to the brain. In, in fact, all right, in the brain. So that's one area, which is a really good point. Um, LSD, right, is a hallucinogenic. So again, LSD might have the same type of receptor. So when you take LSD, it, it may affect, it does affect your um, serotonin receptors. And of course, in an extreme um, freaky way, and it's exas exacerbated or exaggerated way. So this is a hallucinogenic, right? So again, if you're back in the 60s and you're traveling to Nepal with the Beatles and Timothy Leary, it worked then. Now I'm not so sure. I mean, sometimes people do use it for medication and to help people kind of, believe it or not, kind of drown out extra thoughts, you know, to kind of focus more on one thing, especially, um, artistic things, like if you're writing a song or um, doing some writing or graphic design, they do use that DMT or LSD um, agonists, or I should say serotonin agonists. So there you go. So again, if the serotonin is decreased, then you have to use these medications to, to reverse that pathophysiology for whatever it is. Actually, you're not really reversing the pathophysiology. You're just basically treating the serotonin levels because I don't know why somebody would have low production of serotonin biologically, right? And there could be a cause that, again, we could always say autoimmune, we could always say um, problem with that specific development of that particular part of the brain, like the RAF nucleus that produces um, serotonin right? But really all we're doing here is just flooding the synapses again with serotonin by decreasing reuptake. So uh, serotonin, it's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And they're saying specific, which is the same thing. So it's selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor is the key. Your medication is inhibiting the reuptake. So it's stopping the, 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 the reuptake back into the presynaptic axon terminal. So these are examples of SSRIs, which are given off courses of time for um, depression chemically. Prozac, probably the most um, recognizable one. Paxil has been around for a long time in Zoloft, but they, of course they're gonna have side effects and side effects may be manifested differently in one person versus the other. Um, so there you go, serotonin. 
So different receptors, and this is interesting about research, you know, like, especially for something I'm going to talk about in, in the cannabinoids, like you're, you're always finding new receptors, new protein. We, we've, we've isolated a new protein receptor. Like, I don't know how many they have right now for something like in, in the cannabinoids, like um, for marijuana, medical marijuana, uh, CBD, you know, maybe they have nine, you know, last year they had nine, maybe this year they have 10 isolated receptors, the proteins that they were able to define mostly in mice, right? In mice and other mammals. So again, once you find out where the receptors are and what the outcome is, come is you can see the, the different functions. That's why it says diversity of serotonin. Is it, is it, does it have a function in um, dopamine release maybe ultimately, or does it have a function in vasoconstriction in the kidneys as opposed to vasodilation in the brain? So the receptors are key to isolate these proteins to know where they are and what the outcome is when the ligand such as serotonin binds to that receptor and that second messenger like CAMP is employed to phosphorylate another enzyme that creates a change in, in your tissue or your cell. That's why it's important to know this specific target tissue. All right. So drugs like agonists, I guess, agonists of serotonin agonist is going to do the same thing like um like nicotine is an agonist for your acetylcholine receptors because it does the same thing you know so in this case this is going to activate the serotonin so it's an agonist so you can design that in a laboratory of course based on that amine it's very simple so it's a simple structure of course not simple to isolate it and manufacture it but but there you go okay so again different drugs that target serotonin could be given for other things like anxiety of course uh, control of appetite and possibly migraine headaches migraine headaches but you got to be careful with this one because migraine headaches are more about blood flow than nerve uh, synapses it's more vascular so sometimes giving, you know, excess serotonin could actually work backwards and give you a different type of migraine headache. So this is something else that needs more research and practice. But of course, if you can control the vasoconstriction, vasodilation of these cerebral vessels through a good balance of say serotonin or something like prostaglandin or nitric oxide, which are other chemicals that involve and histamine, which involve the radius of the blood vessels, therefore dilating or constricting. Yeah, dopamine. Let's talk about this before we take a break. So dopamine as a neurotransmitter, of course, this is a catecholamine, right? This is a tyrosine-based um, neurotransmitter, a monoamine. So the midbrain is pretty much the main place. The midbrain, midbrain. And you'll learn that's part of the brainstem, the uppermost part of the brainstem before you get into the diencephalon and cerebrum. So the nigro striatal dopamine system, there's a place in the midbrain, um, I'll just put these together, is called the substantia. Nigra, that's a black substance because it looks that way on autopsy. So the cells of the substantia nigra are manufacturing dopamine from that amino acid tyrosine. And the striatal are connections to other parts of the brain, like the basal ganglia, which really is the basal nuclei, if said correctly, and then ultimately to the cerebrum. Okay. And other places, the mesolimbic and dopamine system, and that has to do, whenever you hear limbic, limbic system, we'll talk about this, is your emotional brain. Emotional part of your cerebrum, really. A brain. So emotion meaning fear, um, happiness, rage, 
um, docility, those kind of emotions. Okay. So again, dopamine is involved in that. So this is why it's a reward a neurotransmitter, like give me that cigarette, let's bet on that horse, that kind of thing, which we kind of alluded to before. So here's the substantia nigra. And there's a whole group of nuclei called the basal nuclei. Remember nuclei are a group of cell bodies in the CNS. But old folks like me, for some reason, and you'll hear this all the time if you go to lectures, they call the basal nuclei the basal ganglia. It's been called for that for many years. So it's still kind of accepted, but the true way to say those cell bodies in that substantia nigra is basal and part of the, the substantia nigra is part of the basal nuclei, which we'll see more in CNS. So those are the neurons that are dopaminergic. Can't say adrenergic, they're both catecholamines, but you now you have to say dopaminergic neurons dopaminergic receptors. And then there's the corpus striatum, which is part of the basal ganglia. Yes, okay. So this is important and here's what you have to know because we're ultimately talking about Parkinson's. So dopamine is really part of a, a voluntary muscle contraction loop. So we know what muscle contraction is, is, is voluntary, right? It's somatic, that's true, but Dopamine helps us initiate that movement and kind of let it happen smoothly, like modulate the movement. Like if I'm writing, my hand is all working together with the muscles. My fingers are moving, my wrist is moving all in conjunction. So that's modulating with the help of dopamine from my brain to do that. And it stops the, the movement as well, appropriately, like when you, want voluntarily want that movement to stop like writing with your pen or pen pencil you're gonna be able to stop that movement on time appropriately so parkinson's disease is a degeneration of the basal nuclei which includes the substantia nigra and the basal nuclei is important about important for producing and releasing dopamine so people with Parkinson's do not have, and I don't know the cause of this. I mean, for, for just to have Parkinson's for no reason. But again, it can be caused by, you know, CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy over time. So, but sometimes it's, it's called Parkinson-like conditions or but true Parkinson's is a, is a problem with the basal nuclei, including the substantia nigra, okay? So in this case, these patients are treated and, and this is pretty miraculously, but again, it's not completely satisfactory. They're treated with another type of dopamine, a synthetic type of dopamine, because you can't get dopamine into your system straight up with a medication. You have to give a different version of dopamine to pass the blood brain barrier, right? Remember the blood brain barrier? Dopamine is not gonna cross the, the blood brain barrier. Right, so you need to use a different type of dopamine, and there's a feedback mechanism where if it's too much dopamine, you're going to decrease the, the amount of dopamine produced by the um, substantia nigra or the basal nuclei. So, the combination you have to kind of combine an inhibitor and, and a producer of dopamine, usually, they call that carbidopa, which makes it more effective for keeping enough dopamine in your synapses to, to control these movements. Right, so, and you also use MAO inhibitors as well, because this will stop the breakdown of dopamine because dopamine is a catecholamine, remember? Monoamine, it's a monoamine, just like epinephrine. So you can use monoamine um, oxidase inhibitors for both um, problems with epinephrine and problems with dopamine, too little of each is what you use them for. So that you gotta be clear that this, you know, this is an inhibitor of the enzyme that breaks down catecholamines, including dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay, so the problem here, if you have no dopamine, you're gonna get lack of, of control over movement. So you'll have tremor, right? I, my handwriting will start to change because I can't control the way my fingers write. I have a tremor as well, a shake. And it's at rest too. Like it, it's not always intention tremor where you go to shake somebody's hand and if you contract skeletal muscle 
to get the tremor. It could be at rest as you're just sitting there and, and it could go up and down, wax and wane to actually make the condition strong and then stop. So medication, of course, a lot of research going on with um, these receptors for dopamine and how to increase the production of dopamine or, or just treat the condition of tremors, right? Because it's gonna affect the muscles of your facial expression. It's gonna affect your postural muscles. So most people with Parkinson's have an expressionless mask-like face and a shuffling gait kind of stooped forward because they feel like they're gonna fall backwards all the time. And of course the tremor, it's, and, and eventually it deteriorates your brain and can, can, can lead to dementia. So it's very complicated, you know, in the, in the connections of the brain so that we don't, the brain parts that we really don't know every single thing about until we're doing more research. Okay, so the mesolimbic dopamine system, again, back into the midbrain, which is just adjacent to the substantia nigra, sends neurons to the forebrain, and the forebrain is your cerebrum. I'm not going to break down the brain into uh, front fore and hind brain, ramen, cephalon, and all that, but forebrain is mostly your cerebral cortex where you have where you cognate things, right, and and you have volition for a voluntary movement. So again, dopamine is emotional reward, like we mentioned, right? Which leads to more addictions. And we talked about nicotine, cigarette smoking, you know, gambling, text messaging, right? All those things that have give you spurts of dopamine as a, a reward system within the brain. Schizophrenia is not completely understood, but again, it could be excessive dopamine, too many pathways, too much a dichotomy in the cognition of what's a reward or what's reality, right? Hallucinations, right? So basically the medications for schizophrenia are gonna decrease the amount of dopamine, dopamine by blocking the receptors. So that's an antagonist, antagonist. Okay, so we're gonna come back and let's just Stop that chair, get out of here. Any questions at all? How are we doing? Ready for a break, right? Anybody okay? Any questions, anything? All good? It's hard to ask, I gotta, it's mostly I gotta review this stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I think the sticky points are the, um, you know, the G couple protein receptor cascade. That's a physiology you're going to take with you that's um, really important in this class. Like just some, like, like when we did the Krebs cycle and all that. You know enough about it to see how it applies to human physiology, right? So we'll take it from there. And we'll talk a little bit more um, neurotransmitters and we'll finish up with some CNS stuff and that'll be it for your exam. When we come back, it'll be, again, straightforward. You know, you'll get a uh, good outline in the form of important questions, I think, and concepts. You can always listen to the recordings if you have an hour here and there. Back to norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter. Why not? Let's keep talking about it until you get it right. So this is both in the brain and spinal cord and in the peripheral nervous system. Of course, in the peripheral nervous system, it's going to be more autonomic. And remember the autonomic effectors. I know I keep saying this, but the autonomic effectors are cardiac muscle, smooth muscle, and glands. So yeah, so sympathetic neurons of the PNS, so outside of the CNS. And look what it says. Smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. Those are the effectors. Yes, they are. So smooth muscle, though, is also known as visceral muscle. Visceral means like organ, deep in the body. It's like blood vessels, and GI tract, and respiratory tract, and reproductive. I can go on. But those are the ones, the big ones we need to know about. So in the brain, though, um, arousal 
right? Arousal, not when I get excited when I, I know I'm going to Popeye's, but arousal like waking up in the morning, right? Waking up in the morning when you're aroused from sleep, aroused from a stupor, like I just was at 4.30 when I set my alarm. So yeah, so epinephrine is more of a wakey-wakey neurotransmitter where melatonin is probably more of a sleepy, sleepy hormone. Right? And it can be used as a neurotransmitter. These are all chemical messengers, right? The nervous system works very fast with neurotransmitters, like norepinephrine, epinephrine. And in hormone, it's into the blood, slow release, like epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. Amphetamines work by stimulating the pathways in that arousal network. And you're going to see the Arousal part of the brain is called reticular, reticular activating system. Or the RAS. It has to do with the midbrain as well, starting from the midbrain, going to the cerebral cortex. So yeah, amphetamines will be agonist for that epinephrine release in that arousal network. So like somebody just if I was saying about using beta blockers for performance, well, back in certain days and Elvis Presley types were popping amphetamines like they were M&Ms, you know? And just to keep that high schedule, high, no pun intended, high schedule of dates for gigs and moving from show to show. And it's very addictive, of course. You get used to that, just like nicotine. Other neurotransmitters, excitatory neurotransmitter, NT's neurotransmitter, in this case, it's a glutamate. Now remember, this is in the brain because other places, glutamate can be inhibitory, especially in the visual pathways and also other special senses like, like taste, yeah, and hearing. So in the brain though, this is extremely excitatory and the postsynaptic well, potentials are excitatory and to the cerebral cortex, high alert with glutamate. So yeah, you could say um, epinephrine and glutamate are both excitatory in the brain. And you could probably say that acetylcholine is mostly excitatory in the brain. So why not tell all your friends? Okay. So you do need energy and it takes a lot of energy in your brain, like, you know, using glucose, because the brain only uses glucose. So you're going to burn up a lot of oxygen in ATP by having all of this excitatory synapses going on. So it increases the demand when too much of this is going on. Look at this. The astrocyte, remember, is a glial cell, a neural glial cell specific in the CNS, right? So it takes this, the glutamate from the synaptic cleft to increase glucose uptake and increase blood flow by vasodilation. Okay, so that's just increasing blood flow, right? And you know that astrocytes have to, something to do with the blood capillaries of the brain and also with the blood-brain barrier. So again, it's utilizing a lot of your nutrients, like your fuel for ATP, which is glucose, only glucose in the brain. So again, glutamate receptors also serve as ion channels. And this is your NMDAA receptors. And this is the one you'll hear the most, the NMDA or the AMPA receptors. This one we don't talk too much about, the kinate receptors. So NMDA and methyl. And they work together for memory storage. Now, again, if you have excessive glutamate and these NMDA receptors are constantly being bombarded, this is where you get things like anxiety. This is where you can get excitotoxicity in these receptors. So all the research you're gonna see is on these N NMDA receptors. Now glycine, now we're talking about the CNS mostly here, but also in the PNS. This is inhibitory. So glycine is a neuro, um, an amino acid, right? 
this is an amino acid, but this is going to be inhibitory. So this has to do with opening chloride channels, which I probably mentioned before. So two ways of IPSPs, one is by increasing the potassium leaving the cell, and the other one is by bringing chloride. Did I say calcium before? I meant chloride. Chloride into the cell. And this is potassium. Uh, potassium would be the one that goes outside the cell. Sorry. So again, hyperpolarizes the membrane. That's why it makes it harder to reach the threshold for action potential, of course. Okay. So this is the one that's important in that reciprocal inter innervation that I mentioned before in a reflex, like when, if I stepped on a nail and my quadriceps or EPSP, um, agonist contraction, excitation, where my, uh, did I say quadriceps? I'm wrong again. If I to say this again, if I step on a nail, I withdraw my leg by flexing my knee and that is contraction of the hamstrings. Though hamstrings are the agonists, that's where the EPSPs are. But at the same time you have, and of course, when you have EPSPs, you're opening up sodium channels as um, acetylcholine is binding to the ligand receptors. But in the quadriceps, there's an IPSP where when acetylcholine binds to that receptor for acetylcholine on the quadriceps muscles, they are inhibited. So they relax and they relax and they relax because they're hyperpolarized and the chloride channels are open. So chloride comes in, which increases the negative membrane potential from like 70, minus 70 to above minus 90, or below minus 90, and think of the negativity. So that's why you have antagonistic innervation. It's not saying that, but I think it was Chris that said, we talked about um, reciprocal innervation. Innervation means the nerve power. Inhibition or innervation? Innervation, but you could say inner inhibition as well. But they're both innervated because I want you to be clear that both of those neurons are releasing acetylcholine. So it is innervation. There's one is inhibitory and one is excitatory, but you can say reciprocal inhibition. But in, in neurological textbooks, you're going to say innervation always. Good point. Okay, same thing with the biceps and triceps. If I touch a hot stove, I'm gonna flex my arm. Biceps are the agonist, excitatory. And my triceps will have to relax to flex my elbow in that reflex. And the same thing with a knee jerk reflex when I tap your patella ligament to get extension of the quadriceps and relaxation of the hamstrings. So the agonist is usually being, not always though, but that's why, again, you can't say inhibition for reciprocal. So usually the agonist, not every time, but usually the agonist muscle is excited and the antagonist is um, inhibited, but it can work the other way. It can work the other way. Depends on the reflex and what the stimulus is and what the receptor is somatically. So I can't say that 100% that it's always excitatory. But now you know that it can be both. This is a good one. Glycine important for relaxation of the diaphragm. I like talking about this. So strychnine, use strychnine again, blocks the glycine receptors. So basically you can't breathe out. <laughs> you get, you're stuck in, in respiration. It assaults or arrests your respiration. It results in asphyxiation of the diaphragm or paralysis of the diaphragm. So get this. Let's, here's an interesting physiology that you have to know now. What, this is a physiology class, right? So this is a really important thing. Breathing. I'm just going to talk about breathing as it relates to ner the nervous system. Okay. I might have mentioned this before, but I, who knows? I, mean, I have 400 of these uh, recordings right now. So... You're breathing, right? A resting breath. You know when you breathe, you, you take a breath in and you take a, and, and blow it out, so, so to speak. So in a quiet breath, you don't have to think about that. Am I correct? Right? You don't have to think about breathing in and out. Just to get your oxygen to your alveoli, which goes into your blood, and then you get the carbon dioxide when you 
you exhale. So inhalation, exhalation. Basically ventilation we're talking about. So what happens to the diaphragm to bring the air in? Like we, we live, you know, here, we're here in Manhattan, right? We have, we're at sea level. So the, the partial pressure or the pressure of the atmosphere upon my body is like 760 millimeters of mercury. That's what it is, right? So the pressure in my lungs in between breaths is about the same. It was about 760, right? In between resting breaths. So now there's this guy, he's a dead physicist, his name is Boyle. He says, is if you increase the volume of a container, you're gonna decrease the pressure. So basically when you breathe in, you take a deep breath in, you're increasing the volume of your lungs and you're decreasing the pressure in your lungs. So the, the pressure from the atmosphere goes from a high concentrate or high pressure to a lower pressure. It's simple diffusion, right? That's the way it works. That's exactly the way it works. And then when your volume of your lungs decreases, the pressure increases, and then, then the pressure of the, the air goes is higher inside than goes out through diffusion, right? going from a high pressure to a low pressure. So pressure is inversely proportional to volume, says Boyle. Now, how does that happen with the diaphragm? What does the diaphragm have to do to increase the volume of my lungs? It, does it contract or relax? Play with me here, you or me. Contracts? It does, it contracts. And most of it's skeletal muscle, believe it or not, but that's another story. So the Diaphragm contracts. Does it lower when it contracts or does it come upward? I think it comes upward. No, it goes down. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It lowers. Yeah, it lowers. It lowers. Everybody always has answers that the same. It's always the same. So it does lower on contraction. Now that allows the volume of the lungs to increase and the air comes in. So hopefully there's 21% you know, oxygen in this air and I'll have 160 millimeters of mercury, so it'll get in there nicely and get into my blood. And then, all within you know maybe 16 times a minute, then you're gonna breathe out, quiet though, you're not forcing any of this, because the diaphragm is gonna relax, right? So the diaphragm just passively relaxes, and that'll send the, the air out of your lungs into the atmosphere, which hopefully is, is high in carbon dioxide because there's not a lot of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. There's less than 0.04% uh, carbon dioxide, very low partial pressure in the atmosphere, but there's high in your blood because you, you already contracted all those muscles. Remember, carbon dioxide is a byproduct of aerobic respiration. So there's a lot of carbon dioxide in our blood. And then we have to get that out. So anyway, it's a passive process. The, the diaphragm will just relax and then it'll allow that air to come out. So it's a passive relaxing, but I have to share this with you, sorry. I get out of the show for a minute and share. So I like that they were talking about the diaphragm here on glycine. So the point is, you don't have to think about this, right? You don't have to think about the diaphragm contracting and relaxing, right? Because glycine is gonna inhibit contraction. It's released, and this is not something you have to think about. So the diaphragm, another term for diaphragm is phrenic. Phrenic means diaphragm. So the phrenic nerves, there's two, and they're cervical nerve roots like C. Uh, C3 to C5, nerve roots on both sides will innervate the diaphragm, but they're directly um, stimulated by the medulla oblongata, which is your respiratory center of your brain. So you don't have to think about breathing. So how would we die if we had to think about breathing? lack of sleep, right? We, I think we mentioned this before. You die of sleep deprivation, right? So glycine is the neurotransmitter that's released 
from the phrenic nerves, again, the phrenic nerve is also releasing excitatory acetylcholine and then glycine to relax the, the diaphragm because it just relaxes. It has to relax. So it stops the contraction, basically. That's really an interesting thing. GABA, we talked about that, uh, GABA amino butyric acid. And this one is more inhibitory, again, by opening chloride channels. So this is a good takeaway for your GABA. And we talked about this, right? GABA, right? So if you have problems with GABA, you could have something like anxiety. And this is a, this is a horrible condition, but this, you know, uh, Huntington's disease, and you're gonna learn that the cerebellum is more about motor function, not cognitive function, but motor function, coordination and balance, equilibrium too. Huntington's disease is just a horrible uh, sex link genetic condition. Um, actually, it's not sex link, I don't think. Huntington's disease with Huntington's chorea. And this is a weird one because you have incomplete dominance where it really doesn't show up until you get older. Um, and then you have a complete loss of control of your muscles because you don't have any inhibition, but it's CNS, right? It's coming from the areas of the cere cerebellum, which is part of the brain. So you, you kind of, it's, they used to call it St. Vitus dance. We are always like, look like the person is, is actually in a dance move all the time, the way they're moving. Maybe like Elaine from Seinfeld, right? Horrible condition. And there was a guy named uh, a folk singer called uh, Woody Guthrie who actually died of it and he has a son who's also a uh, was a folk singer is a folk singer still a, a musician named arlo guthrie and uh, everybody just kind of waited around to see if if that gene was going to be expressed the huntington's like his dad but he's still doing fine singing alice's restaurant and all those other songs so here's a gaba Receptor, they didn't show us for all of them, but here's GABA in the synapse released from presynaptic neuron and then binding to its receptor and then allows chloride ions, which hyperpolarizes the membrane. You could have drew, drawn this for me. That's how well you know all this. <clears throat> okay, because we talked about GABA versus glutamate in the brain. <clears throat> so this is a little bit more interesting, a little bit more new, new meaning in the last 10 or 20 years, actually, or more, or more even. Neuropeptides. Now these are small, of course, but they're a little bigger than the monoamines. So these also, I, I like to call these neuromodulators sometimes, but again, these are still polypeptides as neurotransmitters, but they also work as hormones released in the blood. And sometimes locally, like one cell will release this chemical and it'll, it'll act on a very close tissue or another cell that's close to where it was released from. That's in endocrine, that's called paracrine. Like, you know, like if, some, if something's re released from the adrenal gland, it could be, you know, it's targeting the kidney, say, which is distal, far away from the gland that secreted the hormone. But in a paracrine, it could happen in, you know, in, in certain tissue, like inside the kidney, when the tubules, where you have one cell will release a hormone and it'll affect the neighboring cells. Some hormones are released by one cell and it affects its own cell. And that's called autocrine, just so you have an idea what, what they're talking about here. So CCK is cholecystokinin and again, released from your digestive system, mostly, all right? So when this is released, it affects your brain by feeling sated, like you've eaten. It also can, um, increase the release of bile from your gallbladder, which helps emulsify fat. It's not an enzyme bile. Then we have this substance P. This is another neuropeptide. I might've mentioned this. Substance P is the chemical that's released in the case of a, a, a tissue damage. And it gives you the cognition of pain if that receptor neuron reaches your brain. So you know they stepped on a nail and what it is, it's a nail and it hurts. You know what pain is when you can cognate what substance P is. So it's easy to remember, substance P for pain. All right, so neuromodulators are kind of like neurotransmitters. So they may actually affect other neurotransmitters, like they block the binding or block the cognition of another neurotransmitter like substance P. Like, for example, like an endorphin you know, will block 
substance P, all right? So it modulates substance P so you don't feel pain. You know, natural produced um, endogenous opioids like endorphins. <clears throat> so again, these act like neuro neurotransmitters along with another polypeptide sometimes, and they can be released under certain conditions, right? Um, so again, this, we talked about synaptic plasticity, right? Which is important in the brain for forming new pathways, really. You're not really going through mitosis and regenerating destroyed brain cells like in stroke or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, but Maybe if some of the tissue has been damaged in the brain, you could build new synapses and change some of the physiology based on plasticity. So you're altering, you're altering the pathways more than you're altering the neurons, really. So the, molecularly, these neurons change, and it could have something to do with certain neuromodulators. And then astrocytes, of course, would get involved with that, and, and we really don't know exactly how they would be involved. So plasticity is the ability to alter the molecules of the synapses or the neurons themselves to form new pathways to maybe get some memory back or, or get the use of certain parts of your body that were incapacitated after a stroke or injury or other CNS problems like tumors. Okay, endogenous opioids again, polypeptides, and they basically what these medications like opioid, uh, opium, uh, morphine, you know, they used for to treat pain. And we talked about this a little bit. Uh, endogenous opiates are, of course, made by our brain. And they're produced by the brain and the hormones are produced technically by the pituitary gland. So and kephalin and endorphin and dynorphin are the three main um, endogenous opiates. Endorphin is the strongest beta endorphin. So that blocks substance P, blocks substance P. And, and kephalin kind of depresses it, makes it a little bit less. Dynorphin has something to do with emotion too. Dynorphin has something to do with, you know, being scared or being upset, which actually decreases the amount of pain. So these are released more emotionally, dynorphins, right? So again, opioids, of course, because of their cerebral cognitive decreasing pain, they also increase endorph uh, euphoria. So you like get runners high, right? When opioids are released, endogenous opioids are released, the euphoria or the feeling you had after you had to do a really good dance routine or you do something physical, play the cello or something, and you have that feeling of euphoria within, and you don't feel pain, that's for sure. And that comes from the endogenous opioids. So of course that's very rewarding and it's gonna also be involved in the dopamine release. So it becomes very, 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 very addictive if you start taking these things exogenously, right? Or abusing them. So we kind of talked about that last time. That's depressing to talk about, but it's, it's interesting. Neuropeptide Y again is a neuromodulator. And this one is about Appetite, again, right, increases appetite. So it's a stimulator of appetite, which is important, right? When you think about it in your brain to know how, you know, when it's time to eat, you know, when it's important to eat, again, neuropeptide Y. And the chemical, which I think you, we knew, or you knew about it, is leptin, which most of this is secreted from your adipose tissue. So leptin is a chemical or neuromodulator that, that stops neuropeptide Y to give you more of a suppression of appetite or satiety. So leptin decreases appetite, neuropeptide Y increases appetite. Okay. And again, releases glutamate in the hippocampus. Excess of glutamate can cause convulsions Interesting, right? But again, the hippocampus has to do with the limbic system. And this is the one place in the brain, which you'll see, that actually undergoes mitosis in the neurons, which we found. So it's a deep part of the limbic system. The one that looks like, supposedly looks like a seahorse. 
So again, the excess neuropeptide Y, there's research that it does increase excess glutamate, which can cause seizures, really, seizures. So seizures are excess glutamate as well. In fact, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is a toxic levels of glutamate in the synapses, which actually destroys the neurons. Okay. Where were we? No peptide Y. Um, let me just get this out of your way. The endocannabinoid. So these are the ones we make. These are the, the CBD that we make in our body. All right. We're making this. And again, and neurotransmitters um, that are released, these endocannabinoids bind to the same receptors, an active ingredient in marijuana, right, THC. So short fatty acids produced in the cell bodies and dendrites um, released directly from the plasma membrane, okay, basically how they're released. But again, these are naturally made. So we have receptors for them is the key, okay? Not really telling us much except for that. So here's the important thing. Endocannabinoids inhibit the IPSP producing neurotransmitters, right? They have a greater effect. So they say these endo now, these are endocannabinoids, enhance the learning and memory, right? To induce appetite. Now there's another chemical, I, I believe when involved in marijuana that increases appetite that's released from your stomach, it's called ghrelin. So that's a, a, a hormone basically, but again, it's a, it's a modulator that can act as a neurotransmitter to increase appetite, which is good for people on certain medications like, like chemotherapy or something, you know, if they use medical marijuana for the endocannabinoid reason, not for the THC so much, okay? <clears throat> but here's the problem. Marijuana use impairs learning and memory and again, THC is kind of a, a classified drug that is more likely abused and not as good for certain conditions as is the CBD part, the endocannabinoid. So the key is, again, there's receptors for this and it has some efficacy in, in things like um, inflammatory bowel disease, seizures, um, pain from chemotherapy, anxiety, a lot of things that, that we use medical marijuana for. Nitric oxide, this is an interesting one. Nitric oxide, and these, these are kind of similar gases like carbon monoxide is, is CO. It's a deadly gas that chokes the oxygen off our hemoglobin, but nitric oxide is NO. So, Again, this is produced as a paracrine, as a neuromodulator, and it, but it's a gas. So it's produced from neurons in the CNS and the PNS. And again, from it's based on this amino acid L-arginine. And what this causes ultimately is blood vessel dilation and some antibacterial. So blood vessel dilation is the key with NO, nitric oxide. So we try to use nitric oxide to lower blood pressure, all right? Because vasoconstriction systemically increases your blood pressure. And most of the hormones in our system are based on increasing blood pressure because our body's more sensitive to drops in blood pressure, all right? So again, nitric oxide is a dilator Right? And of course, you don't have to worry about the GMP, second messenger, you know, and just stick to the cyclic AMP and the uh, G couple, G protein coupled receptor reaction. So, but this is the key. So this is what nitric oxide is actually the active gas or active source of vasodilation in drugs like Viagra, which is used for um, erectile dysfunction. So originally they, they were trying to isolate the nitric oxide for decrease in blood pressure and, and help with ischemia in coronary vessels, things like that, which it does work for lo locally. 
right? You've heard of like nitroglycerin and, and the things they use for massive vasodilation, but it, it's still used and it's still released and it still works. But again, it's, it, it became used as a huge um, source of income for Pfizer, right? For Viagra, because that they found that actually by mistake for blood vessel dilation to increase your parasympathetic erection. Okay, in the PNS, the autonomic nerve cells, okay, for respiratory passages. Now, this is a little bit different. Again, it says the penis and digestive tract. So again, mostly about muscle relaxation autonomically. But again, it's still more um, vasodilating, right? And, and respiratory is a little different because in the respiratory system, you know, when we're in sympathetic stimulation, your bronchioles are going to dilate and in parasympathetic, they're going to constrict more. So it's kind of the opposite of the blood vessels. So here's the, the Viagra thing. So again, we're, we, we're not really talking about respiratory. So let's just keep it to blood flow in this case and, and some muscle contraction. Because in different areas of the body you could have different types of effect, or different effects. It really has no effect on the actual heart muscle itself, but it affects the coronary vessels, and that's important, especially when they're ischemic, which means they're occluded and they can't really deliver the oxygen to the heart muscle itself. So carbon monoxide, again, we, in, in the right amounts, can be used is as a neurotransmitter. And it activates things like the, you know, the using the olfactory epithelium, the cerebellum. So this is for a sense of smell. But again, it, it's, a, it's an odorless gas. But again, carbon monoxide um, is also a vasodilator. Totally. So again, we don't have to, you don't really have to know a lot of this conversion of heme. But most of the time, it's excitatory, but for vasodilation. And again, at this secondary messenger cyclic GMP. So we're not going to have to know a lot about carbon monoxide in neuro, right? Because that's, I would talk about that more when it comes to cardio and how the carbon monoxide or respiratory carbon monoxide actually binds to hemoglobin where oxygen is supposed to bind. And it basically lowers your oxygen carrying capacity and you have severe drop in oxygenated blood, which gives you the a problem there, but it kind of works the same as carbon, I'm sorry, as nitric oxide, as a neurotransmitter, it binds to a receptor, and there is use for it, but of course, in very, very low levels under investigation. Okay, co-transmitters, again, P P1 receptor uh, for adenosine, you don't have to know any of this, so we're not going to talk about any of this right here. Um, this is pretty good. I think everything on here is really good. You know, it does mention some hormones we didn't really talk about, but again, it breaks down these, this table breaks down all the, all the neurotransmitters that we talked about, which is really great into different classifications based on what they're made of. And that's really important. I think that's important, except for the ones I kind of took some time to talk about. Synaptic in integration. Now this is neural pathways. So again, this is pretty much what we already did. So I think we're gonna go right to the CNS. So again, I'm recording this so you could see where I stopped there. And we gotta get, we gotta move on to the CNS. All right, so I just wanna introduce that for a couple of minutes. Everybody okay with that? Thumbs up if you're good. So I'm not going to do the every pathway because I have to get into the CNS because I think it's so much interesting things. I think we've done enough nuts and bolts with the nervous system in multiple lectures, a lot of different thumbs going up. So let's go over to that and let's let's introduce the um, CNS. And I'll tell you what's on the test from the CNS. Or, you know, everything, I'll give you the questions and what I did on the recordings is really important, of course. And what we talk about now is really good too. So let's just give it a little a little intro to the CNS, which is really good as we wouldn't have to do much next time and we move on to cardio. And I'll probably do the rest of this as a recording for your narration. Fair? Fair. Okay, so the CNS is 
your brain and spinal cord and some of the different parts. Same thing, sensory neurons and integrative neurons and motor neurons, afferent, efferent, basically coming through. So this is a typical mid-sagittal view. This happens to be the right side of the brain. It was cut right in half, right? And we're looking at the different parts. So I'm just gonna give you an intro to what these parts are. So now this is the bottom of the brain. Now we're quadrupeds, so our, our brains are more vertical. Like a, Hi, Professor, could you share your we're screen? We're bipeds, sorry. We're bipeds. Did I say quadrupeds? I'm sorry, I forgot to share. Yeah, this is on. Um, where are we? And I'm not going to do too much embryonic development. So let me share this. Sorry about that. I appreciate that when you do that because sometimes I forget. So this is a mid sagittal view of the, the whole brain. So the largest part of the brain is the cerebrum, right? I always talk about the cerebral cortex, which is the outermost part. But again, this is half a brain. This is looking at the right side of the brain. So all of this is cerebrum in here. And you can see there's like gyrus of the little hills and sulcus of the little in-betweens in there. And this portion right here is not connective tissue, but this is actually the connection between the left and right hemisphere of the brain. So there's two hemispheres of your cerebrum, right and left. This is showing the right side. So the connection between the two hemispheres is called the corpus callosum. So the cerebrum has five lobes, and I'll tell you the five lobes. You have, again, right here is the frontal lobe. Then you have, towards the top, is called parietal. And then you have occipital here. Then on the side, you can't see it, but you have the temporal lobe. And then there's another area called insular. Okay, so that's just general area of the cerebrum. Now the insular is deep to the parietal and uh, temporal, which you can't see because we're looking at the inside of the brain and the spe specifically the right side. So you, the corpus callosum is right in the center. Um, all of this in here is called the diencephalon. which is the thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus. Okay, and we'll talk about each one of them uh, on my recording or next time we meet. So diencephalon is deep brain. And then you have the bottom part of the brain here is called the whole thing. Now it's three parts called the brain stem. Now the brain stem has from top to bottom has the midbrain. Remember we talked about the substantia nigra in the midbrain. Midbrain, the pons, and medulla oblongata. Sorry. Medulla oblongata. And this is the cerebellum, which is basically little cerebrum. That's what that stands for, little cerebrum, just to get you some orientation before we go. So I'll go through this, and I'm going to take a lot of this embryonic stuff out, what we have here. So for this test, I think it's just going to be nerve tissue. I'm not going to put um, 